Welcome to Mistara, where today I'm going to let you in on a strange quirk of learning the Welsh language. One of the first words they ever teach you is drag, or dragon. Considering the Welsh flag is a red dragon on a green and white field, it's a source of pride. Which brings me to this week's topic, the dragonkin of Mistara. These are creatures related to dragons, but aren't true dragons. They have been called false dragons in previous works, but the name is just semantics. So what makes these creatures special, aside from the dragon racial type? That's why you're here. I'm Mr. Welch, and Drag Cook Dwee. I'm only talking about dragon kin endemic to Mastara, or at least that were started in Mastara before they were borked into the Forgotten Realms and adopted by other worlds. Pseudo dragons, dragon turtles, and fairy dragons are all found in Mastara, for example, but they're also found in almost every other D&D setting as well. A fair number of the dragon kin have very little in the way of ecology in Mastara, or even a history, so you'll have to excuse me if I use a little creative license to give them a past and a place in the world. The creatures included today are pocket dragons, sea dragons, dragons, fey wings, and thunderheads. But enough preface, Lake Town ain't gonna burn itself. Pocket dragons are by far the most numerous of the dragon kin, simply because they're small and harmless creatures that are often used as familiar and even pets. They resemble miniature dragons, about the size of a large house cat. They come in every color of dragon, metallic, chromatic, or gem, but they don't possess the attitude of their particular color. A red pocket dragon has the same traits as a gold pocket dragon. They are naturally curious, very playful, and while they aren't sentient, they are quite clever. They're also known for being protective of their owners and will show no fear if their owner is threatened, even if their owner is a full-sized dragon. Especially if their owner is a full-sized dragon. Pocket dragons are carnivorous, hunting down mice and other rodents. In particular, they loved cooked meat, one of the reasons why they try to get adopted as pets. Unlike dragons, they have no breath weapon. Instead, all pocket dragons have a mildly venomous bite, which causes severe pain and can render a limb useless for up to an hour. They can fly short distances, and they can even hover in place briefly. They also hoard treasure like a real dragon, though on a greatly reduced scale. They will often have just a few coins and shiny rocks, but they will guard them with their life. Pocket dragons make great background characters, as they are no danger to an adventurer, and they can be trained to perform small tasks like fetching items. Remember, they're not intelligent, and they can't carry more than a couple of pounds. They also die if you hit them. Remind the player of that when she wants her dr pocket dragon to be brave, not realizing that her pet is also incredibly fragile. Next up is the sea dragon, a creature of some debate among Mistaran scholars. There are many that believe that these are true dragons, despite several differences between sea dragons and other dragons. They tend to be smaller in mass than true dragons, though they are often much longer because of their tails. They can't fly, but possess fin-like wings that allow them to glide through the air for a full minute of flight. They obviously breathe water naturally, an ability that true dragons lack. Only about one in five can talk, but those that can talk will almost always be spellcasters. Their breath weapon is a deadly contact poison that they can spit through the air or water equally. Sea dragons like to raid ships for food and treasure, something that marks them as a target for Minrathad and Irindi navies. They can be bought off with regular tribute, which is often less expensive, both in terms of lives and treasures, than hunting the creature down and killing it. There have been sea dragons of immense size recorded in history. Apparently there's no limit to their size, but the dragons are rather territorial. And fights to the death between them are common, with the winner taking the loser's territory. Sea dragons care little except for themselves, and other than their young, they live solitary lives under the ocean. A dragon has the head of a lion, the body of a gold dragon, and the marketing potential of a kid's toy. They are found in desert climates and are magical creations. So who do we know that also live in a desert climate and love to mess with the laws of nature and creation? That's right, the Nithians. Chalk this bad boy up to those crazy pseudo-Egyptian conquerors. However, with no more Nithia, the dragons have been left to their own devices. They have flourished in the deserts of Yalaram, but are found in other dry climates, including parts of the Savage Coast, where the Nithians also had colonies. That is a reoccurring theme. If you want to know how magical monsters limited to specific areas reached across the globe, blame the Nithians. Technically, dragons are found in any climate except for settled and aquatic, according to the creature catalog. But this is also contradicted in other descriptions in various books saying that they're arid creatures. So split the difference. You can find them almost anywhere, but they're only found in large numbers in desert or arid lands. Dragons will attack and eat anything their size or smaller, preferring to glide in from above and attack. Their roar is devastating. It will deafen and stun prey, making for an easy meal. Dragons can be used as flying mounts, but the process is long, arduous, and, if done improperly, fatal. Because of this, nations and groups that use flying creatures extensively, like the Retebius Air Fleet, prefer to use other creatures. The three-headed Feywing are a twisted and cursed creature, remnants from a time of war and treachery in the distant past. 
When the Great Barrier went up and cut off the gods and archfiends from Astara and other worlds, some of the gods were not going to be denied the souls and worship they viewed as rightfully theirs. One of the gods, a petty tyrant named Tiamat, sacrificed untold worshippers to breach the barrier and demand worship among Mastara's dragons. She convinced several dragons to join her before the Great One and the other dragon immortals arrived and sent the pathetic usurper back through the Great Barrier, piece by bloody piece. The dragons that swore fealty to her were warped into Feywing as punishment. Fey wings resemble the defeated invader from thousands of years past. They have three heads, each one eternally hungry. They aren't intelligent, another trait stripped of them by the Great One. They have no breath weapon, but can fly as normal. They gather treasure out of instinct without knowing its true worth. Instead of the great and majestic creatures they once were, they're reduced to stealing cattle and other livestock to survive. They are hunted by true dragons, as well as wizards, because fey wings can be substituted in magical research for dragon parts, something that the true dragons encourage. Thunderheads are related to wyverns, but lack that creature's signature poisoned tail. Instead, they have the unusual ability to channel the power of lightning that gives them their names. They are found anywhere thunderstorms are common, and will travel with the storms to terrorize new areas. They fly inside the storms, only leaving them to hunt creatures below the clouds. They don't just hunt their prey, they also enjoy tearing it apart slowly, seemingly enjoying the creature's suffering. Thunderheads are typically solid black, with only a set of wings and legs with no forearms. Their heads are elongated, and their bodies are long and narrow like a snake. They have excellent vision and can see for miles, as well as seeing through clouds and rain. The trait Thunderheads are best known for is their ability to channel lightning from the storms through their body and projecting it at their prey. Thunderheads are rarely found outside of storms, because the weather magically enhances them, and while they are still formidable opponents, outside of storms they are noticeably weaker. This concludes our look at Dragonkin, and hopefully gives you a new look at some creatures to unleash on your players. Most of the monsters are just needing to be slain, but Dragon can be used as possible mounts, and pocket dragons are there to be used by players for role-playing and story purposes. Next week, we are headed to the Hollow World to take a look at the twisted cousins of the Shadow Elves, the Shotnalfin, or what happens when you leave your drow out too long in the sun. But until next week, quit dragging my heart around.